Tonight's guest has come a long way from his days as a seminarian, a student activist, an advisor to a Middle Eastern kingdom, and an architect and urban planner, Balik Bayan, whose dreams have not waned for the Philippines that he loves, despite all our woes and inefficiencies. Join us tonight as we explore and trace the journey of Jun Palafox, multi-warded architect, visionary, and dreamer. Architect Jun, thank you so much for hosting us in your office. Yeah, thank you, Tintin. Glad to we had the opportunity to share with your listeners. It was at a serious point and juncture in your life that you actually joined the seminary. Tell us about that. Yes, um, at age 13, uh, I decided to enter the seminary. Because at that time, I thought I had the vocation to be a missionary priest. And one thing they taught us is to be a good leader, first you must be a good follower. And, and among many other things. And uh, we did an opus at Manuali, uh, uh, work and pray. And that, that was a very disciplined life. So you had the rigor of uh, preparation for the priesthood, and yet you had global minds shaping you as mentors. Tell us how that influenced you, even today, even if you're now in another profession. It was, I think, my first exposure to living with uh, international uh, foreign mentors, and regional also, so seminarians from all over the country and mentors from all over the world, especially Germany, the rest of Europe, and, and the U.S. And I think it really, uh, they, they form what I am today. And of course, the, the values uh, that I, I still stick on today, because the, the core values will end in the seminary, and I, I share it here. They are like lighthouses that even in a stormy weather, they'll always be there to guide us. Yeah. Now, you see this faith actually transition you into another career, but it's all about how architecture actually influenced you. The architecture of the church, for example, did that play, play a role in you transitioning out of your vocation in the seminary and into one in the secular world? Indeed, it did because uh, just uh, my parents' home was just across the church, big church and a big tower. And and in my childhood, the things that I enjoy going going to church every day and going to the beach and week again. And in the beach, other children would do sandcastles. I would do townships, mountains and buildings and rivers and bridges. So when... Uh, so you're doing a sim city on sand. Yeah. <laughs> Already. So later in life, it, it, it keeps coming back, what I was working on. Then in the seminary, in fourth year, I really did a, a very serious discernment. And I realized I may not have had the vocation for the priesthood. And it may have been my parents who influenced that decision. And in my childhood also, my art teacher was my mother. She learned me how to draw. And they were telling me that among the 10 children, I was the most artistically inclined. So when I realized I didn't have the vocation to be a missionary priest, I took up architecture. And this is good again because uh, those were in the late 60s and early 70s, the, the age of uh, activism, yes. openness, freedom. Now, you were student activism, but that actually was the beginning of some other sacramental gift in your life, which is the gift of the relationship with your current wife, basically, in terms of how you met, how you fell in love, and how you built this life together for close to 40 years now. 40 years, here? yeah. In my college days before graduation, my goal was see the world, be a, success, be a successful architect, then get married. The reverse happened, but... Uh, I'm happy about it. It'll work out. The outcome, is, the outcome out. is still richer than you imagined. Yeah, yeah. and my, everywhere, my, my wife had always been very supportive. And she joined me in Dubai, the whole family. Tell us how that influenced yeah. you and how you helped build that dream in Dubai. Yeah. I was very fortunate because I was name hired. I did not know about Dubai. And it was uh, Sultan Khalifa, very close to the ruler of Dubai, who came to the Philippines to interview me, invite me to work in Dubai. They were impressed with the Met World Bank funded Metro Plan Manila, which I was a team leader. Uh, and I was only 25 to, at age 26, when the invitation to go to Dubai was offered. So I had to finish Metro Plan before I reported to Dubai. And this is not the Dubai we know it as today. This was probably yeah. the skyline was barely there yeah. yet, and it was still transitioning 
from an oil-based economy into a financial sector. Yeah. Tell us how it came about that you came into that profession and how you helped even grow that, uh, yeah. that, that city for yeah. you with your efforts. For Dubai, I was the, we were about 20 expats, expatriates and, uh, I was from 14 countries. I was the youngest. I was the only one from the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Rashid, the father of Sheikh Mohammed, at that time he was telling us already, design Dubai as if there's no oil. Because in 35 years, there's no more oil. Create a garden city out of the desert. Then uh, make Dubai as the gateway city, the best city in the Middle East and North Africa. Every year of service, we're encouraged to one month go around the world with our family and benchmark learn lessons from other cities and countries and, and bring it to bring it back Dubai. to Dubai and and I think Dubai for me was really a great challenge and learning experience because we did not just have professional differences also uh, multicultural and and Dubai it's really the 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 tagline they say you realize your dreams in Dubai I think most profession professionals and businessmen who went to Dubai were encouraged to grow and be successful. And before Dubai, not many people knew me in the Philippines. And it was Dubai that I met the leaders of industry and government. And you built your cachet as a professional and your reputation there as well as the city transformed itself. Yes. But in the meantime, if I could were to ask you, what were the two or three things that you learned from Dubai that the Philippines could use as it makes its way also into a transition to a developed country? One really is they are it's really the leadership and innovation, they encourage it. And as I said, strong political will, visionary leadership, uh, good planning, good design, and good governance. And it's there, they practice it. Well, it's fascinating that you mentioned that visionary leadership. You're also talking about leading by example, and more importantly, that culture of excellence. But you're only as good as the people you have. So I look forward to hanging out with some of your staff and, and your yeah. team members. Honesty, integrity, professionalism, uh, business orientation, uh, the environment, and spirituality. Those are called values. And I always wanted to be number one. If somebody told me nobody remembers number two. Architect, you're at the height of your success, and yet it didn't come so easy. You actually started out with an invitation to come back from your wonderful professional job in Dubai, back to Manila. Tell us how that came about. I had a visit from uh, Henry C. He asked around Dubai, uh, Philippine architects in Dubai told him that a young architect helping the ruler of Dubai, and because they saw the uh, rapid transformation of Dubai, and then we also got uh, the visitors from executives of Ayala. Then they tell the late Enrique Nobel that should I, they were inviting me to come home here. So when I came home, it was a choice between Henry C. and and the Sobel. Well, that just happens to be two of the biggest pillars okay. of the business community. And right? Henry C. was like the head of the Filipino Chinese uh, business leader and uh, Filipino Spanish. Otherwise, I, I may never have come, and come back. You got both. That's a wonderful incentive to come home. You got both sides of the business community, both sides of the, and the spectrum of Philippine business, yeah. asking you to help transform the skyline as you did yeah. with Dubai. Tell us how you set about making that happen. That one, I was uh, like a consultant to them, and then Ayala, head of planning, architecture, and so on. So Ayala Labang, Ayala Heights, Cebu Business Smart. Redevelopment of Those landmarks that we see it. today. Yeah. Then after leaving employment, I put a pile of associates. My first clients are two Taipans again, JY Campus of Greenfield Unilab and Henry C. Then later on, Henny Lopez of the Lopez Group. Almost all the Taipans and Taipans, if not all of them, have been our clients. And when we started uh, uh, July 1989, our economy was a state of flux. People tell me why leave a lucrative job with Ayala. With a very risky environment, risky even if it's your home environment. Yeah. And when we started it, it's, uh, there were coup attempts, the China, uh, Ch Chinaman Square massacre, the fall this of the, the Berlin Wall. This is the 80s, early 90s, right? Very volatile places. Yeah. 1989. Then I started with uh, three people. Then I said, 
the whole world is our client. And also, uh, the Philippines is less than 1% of the world's population, and the more than 99% is outside. outside so yes. we focus outside, and surprisingly, we had walk-in clients from Japan, uh, Indonesia, Saipan. Into your Philippine Dubai. headquarters, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a small office, and, and uh, just by word of mouth, like Rockwell. We were only... You're from a former power plant, yeah, diesel, power plant. you know, bunker yeah. fire power plant yeah. complex. You've got and it the in the master plan and the architecture, the first five towers to set the tone, the standard. And, and ever since then, we have done work in 39 countries. And I also get invited to talk, give lectures, and I've done it in 19 countries. So 39 countries in projects, 19 countries giving lectures. Yeah. Now, architect, what is your guiding principle in terms of growth? Because it's also easy to get distracted or set aside in terms of what you started out to begin with and, and, and yet lost along the way. How did you keep yourself in terms of your constancy to vision and your culture of excellence? Yeah, we had the, the vision, the mission, the values, core values, very important. So number one really is uh, honesty, integrity, professionalism, uh, business orientation, uh, the environment and spirituality. Those are called values. And I always wanted to be number one. If somebody told me nobody remembers number two. So 1989, by 1999, we became the first Filipino firm in the top 500 architects in the world. And I did not even know that in 10 years we would do that. The goal was in 25 years. Then after that, I wanted us to be number one in Southeast Asia. By 2006, we were the first Southeast Asian firm to make it to the top 100 architects in the world, according to uh, World Architecture Magazine London. So it's a it's an international firm uh, magazine that were rating us. You know, and certainly, those accolades speak for themselves. But one thing I noticed about what your work is about mm -hmm. is looking at beyond or looking beyond commercial aspect and into architectural activism. Tell us about how you got into that vocation and yeah. why it means a lot to you. Yeah, what we were doing, and it was affirmed by my professors at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And they told me, you may be the best architect, urban planner in the world, but if you work in a society that doesn't address effectively corruption, criminality, climate change, poverty, pollution, too much politics, be an architectural activist. And I think that was addressed for for us in the Philippines and Latin America and African countries and parts of Asia. And, and we see that if we address our challenges, especially corruption, criminality, and climate change, we should be as a nation in the top 20 economies of the world. You know, those three, those three aspects, those three areas could be actually a platform for governance. And you have advocated that as, as, as well, the first architecture head of, or the first architect head of the Management Association That's of the Philippines. Right. Now, how important is the built environment in terms of influencing the kind of battle against climate change, corruption, and all these others? Yeah. I think it was Churchill who said, we, we shape our buildings and our buildings shape, shape us. Shape us, yes. And I say, we shape our environment and our environment shape us. And um, I, I believe that most Filipinos are honest. Maybe only 1% are corrupt. But people don't seem to care anymore or they've given up. And, and somebody will speak out. And, and if there's no corruption, I believe there's no poverty. 28 million Filipinos are below the poverty line. But with so much corruption, and for me, corruption, which also learned in the seminar, corruption from, comes from two Latin words, core, the heart, rapture, to break the heart. And if you fight corruption, you're actually helping the poorest of the poor. It's a corporal works of mercy by fighting corruption. And, and I think without corruption, we should have modern infrastructure ready. We wouldn't have all these problems and traffic, flooding, and so on. And this uh, money that's being stolen could have been used for education, infrastructure, and, and other uh, social services. I find it fascinating that you put it this way and you link that full circle to your seminary yeah, days. Yeah. We have, uh, uh, maybe like for instance, this one here. Uh, I call them postcards from the future. Pasig River is so polluted. But if we clean it up to, uh, with urban planning and architecture, we can 
make it as a front door of development that will link together the different cities in the, Metro Manila and Manila Bay and Laguna Lake. And you can, bring, you, you can bring the metropolis back to life because it's the river right. links everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like Rockwell, when we planned Rockwell, after the plans, the land values went up 15 times, even before the permits. And, and we, we, we do it through architecture. Another thing that we do is uh, we take pictures of the uglification of our cities and we draw, we draw architectural perspectives, how they should look like. And I call it postcards from the future. Well, it's, a, it's, something, it's certainly something a policymaker or an ordinary citizen can understand because yeah. these are it's, vignettes and very simply translated yeah. into a vision, right? Instead of writing only in, in words or complaints, we draw it, even the recommendation. And it resonates because people are, we're visual people, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and other countries recognize it. Like, we send recommendations to government, even the office of the president, and if they don't listen to us, other countries ask for a copy of what we're recommending. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, well, speaking of the future and your legacy, let's talk to someone who will carry that future with you uh, for the long term, yeah. okay? Yeah. All right. Making sure that we all live by the principles and values from which the company was founded, so honesty, integrity, professionalism. <laughs> Architect John, you spoke about building a culture of excellence and planning for the future to build your legacy. We have Carmi here to talk about that part of the legacy, but I want to see how it actually comes together in terms of where you intend to take Palafox Associates and Palafox Architecture Group to the next wave in the future. When we turn 25 years for Palafox Associates, we spun off a new firm, Palafox Architecture Group. Out of five architectural studios from Palafox Associates, which I I, I'm the first pres the president now, and for Palo Associates, Carmi was uh, promoted to be the managing partner and of course senior urban planner. But for Palo Associates, I'm still the principal architect urban planner and, and president and principal architect for Palo Fox Architecture, of which Carmi is the director and, and the boss at Palo Fox Associates. <laughs> Carmi, you've built your own credentials, I mean, stayed at Oxford Brooks your own vision and skills for the future. Tell us how do you intend or where do you intend to take this firm as the generations evolve? We wanted Palafox Associates and Palafox Architecture Group to be unique in the sense that if you look at all the other architecture companies in the Philippines, they tend to die after the founder passes away or stops being active. So we wanted to continue on my father's legacy, like 20, 30, 100 years, even when he stops designing um, these landmark buildings that he designs. And uh, we intend to do that by, for example, we strengthened our team. So it's, I'm not leading the companies alone. So we chose uh, leaders from different generations. So my dad's generation, my generation, and Gen Xers as well and uh, making sure that we all live by the principles and values from which the company was founded, so honesty, integrity, professionalism. We're also strengthening our partnerships with other companies um, here and abroad. For example, we have a partnership with a Swedish firm, one of the biggest in Sweden, and we're looking into um, how we could work more with uh, other ASEAN uh, nations. You're in the middle of the transition, so I want to understand how is it you know, and, and same with Philippine fa family corporations or firms. How does that working relationship turn out on a day-to-day -day basis? Tell us, give us an example of how you work together and how you're doing this as you build your firm further. Yeah, we, we agree a lot. We also agree to disagree a lot. Maybe because of my Harvard education and uh, uh, Oxford Brooks education. Well, you got the best <laughs> of both already. <laughs> <laughs> but she also holds the purse strings, I hear. Right? <laughs> so tell us, Carl, from your point of view, then how do you build from a foundation yeah. and also a long shadow of your father in the firm? Yeah. Well, one is, um, I think I'm very blessed that I'm learning from the best. I'm learning from the best urban planner, urban designer, architect. And I'm very lucky because he allows me to argue with him most successors aren't as lucky. Like, they just have to keep saying yes. Very top-down. <laughs> yeah, very top-down. Not with my dad. So he, I think it's because of how he is. Like, until now, he's learning. He still goes to, to school whenever he can. So, and he likes learning from me and some of our younger colleagues as well. 
And um, well, I've had to move out of the house, for example, just to <laughs> yeah. to keep the the distance. Well, so the arms length is always good. Yeah. <laughs> so you know we have this rule. We're in the office. We talk about business. We talk about um, work. That's wonderful that you've built a culture of excellence here. And again, I wish you all the best as we spill this over to the metropolis and other mm -hmm. communities that you seek to build with your architectural a activism and your growth plans for the future. Mm -hmm. Carmi, architectural, thank you so much for joining us today on Talk Leaders. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank as you as for well. your opportunity to share. I'm Kinden Pastrana. Join me again next week as I explore the minds and trace the moves of the country's and region's most successful people.